Hello, sports history fans. This is Joe Ziemba. I'm the host of When Football Was Football here on the Sports History Network. And before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's new sponsor. We at the Sports History Network have partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States where you can get great deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. Rochester Sports Autographs even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site. So, there's really something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day already, or Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about a gift for yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups. And they choose to pass the savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to the following. ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN. That's ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN to get your piece of sports history today. Hi there, baseball fans, and welcome back to the ballpark. This is the Pastime Timeline Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilkinson, and today it's the 1904 Major League Baseball season. The dead ball era of baseball is generally defined as the first two decades of the 20th century. When compared to the post-1920 history of the game, much of what came before it could be labeled the dead ball era, with the noted exception of a power surge in the late 1880s and early 1890s. In the earliest stage of the sport, the job of the pitcher was to serve the batter a good ball to hit instead of trying to get him out. Even though the game at that point revolved around the batter, the ball didn't start flying until the babe showed up in the 1920s. Once the role of the pitcher transformed to being the first line of defense, going to all lengths to get the hitters out, the game began to increasingly revolve around the men on the mound. And the 1904 campaign was dominated by pitchers like never before. A newly widened home plate and a legal spitball were among the rules causing an offensive crisis. Team batting averages were down roughly 30 points. This was the first of the deadest of dead ball seasons. This season had a modern era record 41 game winner. Even though win totals have now been devalued in the pro game, they meant much more in an era when pitchers were expected to complete a vast majority of the games they started. For example, this 41-game winner threw 48 complete games out of 51 starts. 1904 also saw a pair of teammates with 35 and 33 victories respectively. The all-time strikeout record for a 154-game season was established. The AL championship team used just five pitchers the entire year. One member of that staff went 337 innings without being relieved. Another threw the first perfect game of the century as one of 10 shutouts. That championship club didn't boast a single 300 hitter. And only one American League team averaged four runs per game for the season. So that new foul ball strike rule in the AL definitely cut heavily into the overall offensive production. And we'll see a lot more pitching prowess when we get into the timeline. Most of us were alive in 2004 when the Boston Red Sox ended eight plus decades of being tortured by the New York Yankees. 100 years earlier, however, it was Boston which emerged victorious in the first great pennant race between the rival cities. With the advent of league playoffs in 1969 and further expansion in 1995 and 2012, the truest, purest form of a pennant race became a thing of the past. The quest for the 1904 American League Championship was the first great race of the 20th century. Boston had won the world title in 1903, 
while New York was stocked with veteran stars and built to win immediately. However, I'm guessing not even Van Johnson could have envisioned his league's championship coming down to a head-to-head -head final series between the behemoth East Coast rival cities. The teams went back and forth in first place for much of the summer. Chicago, Cleveland, and Philadelphia all competed as well, but fell off by the time the new 154-game schedule took the race into October. Leading by half a game, Boston traveled to Manhattan on October 7th for five games to finish the campaign. The last day of the season, October 10th, dawned with Boston ahead by a game and a half. New York needed to sweep that day's doubleheader to usurp the AL throne. In Game 1, New York 41-game winner Jack Chesbro battled Bill Deneen into the ninth tied at 2. With catcher Lou Krieger on third base, Chesbro unleashed a two-out, two-strike wild pitch to plate the eventual winning run for Boston. Despite posting a seasonal win total that has never and will never be touched after, Chesbro had lost the pennant on a single pitch. Sadly, his career would slowly fall apart from this point. So defending world champion Boston claimed its second straight pennant and took what would be a temporary upper hand in the Boston-New York AL rivalry. But they would fall victim to the resumption of the feud between John McGraw, the New York National League owner, and American League president Van Johnson. And we'll get to that in the postseason section when there wasn't a postseason in a little bit. Now the timeline of events for the 1904 season. March 10th, the New York National League club escapes Mobile, Alabama to evade a warrant for their arrest for beating an umpire unconscious during an exhibition game, a strange start to what would be a banner year for that club. April 26th, Ty Cobb makes his professional debut in the Class C South Atlantic League, going two for four with a single and a double. However, in his autobiography published years later, Cobb insists he hit an inside-the-park home run in that game. May 5th, Boston's 37-year-old Cy Young throws the first perfect game of the 20th century and the first at the pitching distance of 60 feet 6 inches. His second of three career no-hitters is a 3-0 victory over Rube Waddell in Philadelphia. May 11th, Young's string of consecutive no-hit innings is snapped at 23 by Detroit. Young and Boston still win the game 1-0 in 15 frames. May 21st, Boston shortstop Bill O'Neill makes six errors in a 13-inning contest. May 27th, New York National League first baseman Dan McGann steals a record five bases. He has a career high of 42 for the season. June 11th, Chicago National League curler Bob Wicker allows no hits into the 10th inning of a 1-0 12-inning victory over New York. Sam Mertis breaks up a no-no in extras for the second time in his career. The tough luck loser Iron Joe McGinnity sees his 14-game winning streak come to an end. June 13th, in an early career matchup of all-time superstar hurlers, Chicago's Mordecai Threefinger Brown tops New York's Christy Mathewson 3-2 at the Polo Grounds. Frank Chance leads the victors by hitting for the cycle. June 16th, Mathewson begins a string of 24 consecutive victories on the mound with a win over St. Louis. June 18th. Boston American League trades outfielder Patsy Doherty to rival New York for oft-injured infielder Bob Unglob. Doherty had been a huge part of Boston's 1903 championship team. July 4th, Jack Chesbro of New York American League extends his personal winning streak to 14 games. July 5th, Philadelphia knocks off New York 6-5 in 10 innings to snap an 18-game winning streak. July 13th, Napoleon Lajoie hits three triples in Cleveland's AL 16-3 victory against New York. August 10th, Chesbro is knocked out of a contest against Chicago, ending his run of 30 straight complete games. August 11th, St. Louis National League player manager 35-year-old Charles Kidd Nichols strikes out 15 in a 17-inning 4-3 win over Brooklyn. August 17th, 
Jesse Tannehill pitches a no-hitter for Boston American League in a 6-0 win over Chicago. August 24th, New York AL star Wee Willie Keeler hits a pair of inside-the-park home runs against St. Louis. September 22nd, in a 7-5 pennant clinching win over Cincinnati, New York National League catcher Jim O'Rourke catches the entire game and picks up one hit. It's the first Major League appearance for O'Rourke since 1893. He's 52, and I also saw in another book he was 54 years old, so either way, well into his 50s, quite an accomplishment for uh, Jim O'Rourke. September 30th, Chicago AL pitcher Doc White notches his sixth shutout in the month of September. October 2nd, White's stretch of 45 straight scoreless frames is snapped by New York in Chicago. October 3rd, Matthewson fans 16 St. Louis batters. October 6th, St. Louis's Jack Taylor, picked up in the three-finger Brown trade during the previous offseason, fires his 39th consecutive complete game. That's a post-1892 Major League record. October 7th, Chesbro beats Boston 3-2 to notch his 41st win. He becomes the first pitcher to lead each league in winning percentage for a season. Also on October 7th, for the first time in Major League history, a batter homers off his brother. George Stovall goes deep for Cleveland against his older brother Jesse of Detroit. October 10th, Bill Deneen finishes his own start for the 37th straight time in Boston's pennant-clinching victory over New York. Later that same day, George Winter's 1-0 loss for Boston AL is the club's 148th complete game of the season. October 28th, Cleveland fires manager Bill Arbor and hires Napoleon Lajoie. Armour signs on to manage Detroit. And lastly, November 2nd, Arthur Newbold and James Potter agree to buy the lease and effects of the Philadelphia National League franchise at a sheriff's sale. Their ownership will last just one year. Here are the final standings for the 1904 MLB season. First in the American League, first place in champion Boston, 95 wins, 59 losses, a 617 winning percentage. Second place, New York, 92 wins and 59 losses, 609, a game and a half back. So what must have happened here was, even though they were tied in the loss column, Boston did have the tiebreaker in terms of the season series. So even if New York made up the three games they missed and won them, Boston still would have won the pennant. Third place, Chicago, 89 and 65, 578 percentage, six games back. Fourth place, Cleveland, 86 and 65, 570, seven and a half games behind. Philadelphia, 81 and 70, percentage of 536, 12 and a half games off the pace. Sixth place, St. Louis, 65 and 87, 428, 29 games out. Detroit, seventh place, 62 and 90, 408, 32 games back. And 55 and a half games out of first place. Yikes. Washington, 38 and 113, a winning percentage of just over 25% at 252. National League, runaway champions, New York, 106 and 47, 693 winning percentage, winning almost 70% of their ball games. Finishing 13 games out in second place, Chicago, 93 and 60, 608. Third place, Cincinnati, 88 and 65, 575 percentage, 18 games out. Fourth place, Pittsburgh, 87 and 66, 569, 19 games behind. Fifth place, St. Louis, 75 and 79. They played at a 487 clip, 31 and a half games out. 50 games back, 6th place Brooklyn, 56 and 97, 366. 7th place Boston, 55 and 98, 51 games out, and their winning percentage was 359. And finally, last place Philadelphia, 52 and 100, 342 percentage. They finished a whopping 53 and a half games out. 
Now let's go through the league leaders, American League, batting champion, and I think you can repeat after me, yep, that guy again, Napoleon Lajoie of Cleveland, 381. I also saw 376 in another reference. Home run champion Harry Davis of Philadelphia with 10. Lajoie also won the RBI title with 102. Runs leader for the second straight year, Patsy Doherty, 113. He split his time, as I mentioned, between Boston and New York. Very rare trade between the two teams competing for the pennant. But uh, Doherty goes over to New York midseason, uh, and he keeps scoring runs, 113. Stolen bases, two teammates tied for first. Harry Bay and Elmer Flick of Cleveland had 38 apiece. And then that wins leader, Jack Chesbro, the tough luck loser on the uh, final day of the season. 41 wins for him, a record that uh, may never even be anywhere near approached. I think the uh, closest recently was Denny McLean with uh, 31 wins in 68. So no one's really come within 10 of this in decades. ERA champion. A new superstar on the scene, Addie Joss of Cleveland with a 1.59. And once again, mowing him down in a ridiculous clip, Rube Waddell, the lefty from Philadelphia, 349, which I believe, as I said, was still a record for a 154-game season. It was surpassed once they went to the 162. National League leaders. And batting champion again, Honus Wagner of Pittsburgh, 349. Home run champion, Harry Lumley of Brooklyn with 9. RBI champion, Bill Dolan of New York with 80. Runs leader, George Brown of New York with 99. So New York had a very solid, if unspectacular, offense, but they did lead the National League in most offensive categories. Wagner won the stolen base title with 53. Wins leader on the mound, Iron Joe McGinnity, once again, 35. He also won the ERA title at 1.61. So McGinnity taking second fiddle to Chesbro this year, uh, quite unfair. He may have had the better season, and he did get his team to the pennant. And strikeout leader, Christy Mathewson, 212, and he's about to take off into superstardom. So now the postseason section. New York National League team had finished dead last in 1902 when John McGraw took over midseason. Following a second place showing in 03, the stunningly quick turnaround was completed in 1904. McGraw's men won 106 games and lost only 47, and that record looked even better considering they only won two of their final ten. The new champs had a solid, if unspectacular, offense, but their top pitching tandem was sublime, perhaps still the best of all time. Joe McGinnity's league-leading 35 wins and 1.61 earned run average still placed him as the staff's ace over Christy Mathewson, as hard as that is to believe. Mathewson only won 33 with 212 Ks and an ERA just over 2. Dummy Taylor added 21 victories, as the club finished 13 games in front of runner-up Chicago. Boston, meanwhile, had a 20-plus win trio of Cy Young, Bill Deneen, and Jesse Tannehill, and they likely would have matched up quite well with New York staff, but the baseball world never got the chance to see the series. That's because New York flat-out refused to play against the American League. As McGraw saw his team pull away from the NL Pact, the war of words commenced concerning a possible second modern world series. Let's allow the direct quotes from the parties involved tell the story. So this battle of words really began back in July as New York was clearly going to win the pennant. Johnson and McGraw were going back and forth with each other. McGraw called the AL a minor league, and this was his quote. The Giants will not play a postseason series with the American League champions. Van Johnson has not been on the level with me personally, and the American League management has been crooked more than once. Johnson fired back, quote, No thoughtful patron of baseball can weigh seriously the wild vaporings of this discredited player who was canned out of the American League. McGraw added back, 
My team will have nothing to do with the American League, and nothing will make me change my mind. New York owner John Brush had even more pointed comments against the AL. His quote, We are content when our season is ended to rest upon our laurels. The club that wins from the clubs that represent the cities of Boston, Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis, the eight largest and most important cities in America, in a series of 154 games, is entitled to the honor of champions of the United States without being called upon to contend with or recognize clubs from minor leagues. Neither the players nor the manager of the Giants nor myself desires any greater glory than to win the pennant in the National League. That is the greatest honor that can be obtained in baseball. Clark Griffith, the manager of the New York American League team, they fired back, quote, Brush's statement is not a surprise to us. He always was a sure thing fellow, and his remarks indicate that he is hiding behind a bush. McGraw knows well that almost any team in the American League can beat the Giants, so it is no wonder to me that he is fighting shy of a series with the Yankees. Of course, we have not yet won the pennant, but I am confident that we will. It seemed Brush and McGraw were most apprehensive about facing their Big Apple counterpart, and when Boston won the AL, they couldn't go back on their words. We'll never really know, but the future of the Fall Classic was up in the air going into the 1905 season. So that's the wrap-up of the 1904 MLB season here on the Pastime Timeline. My name is Michael Wilkinson. I'm your host, and I invite you to have a great day. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Darren Hayes, host of the Pigskin Dispatch and Jersey Dispatch podcast. I hope you've enjoyed another great episode here on Sports History Network. Now, speaking of sports history, this episode was brought to you by Firefly Books, and they have two great ones for you this summer. For basketball fans, they have the NBA 75, the definitive history by author Dave Zaram, who's appeared on our Jersey Dispatch podcast recently. He tells about the experience, the thrilling journey of the NBA from its humble beginnings to its modern glory. Uncover the untold stories of triumph, controversy, and the greatest stars of the game. This isn't just a book. It's courtside seats to over 75 years of NBA history. And for the golf enthusiasts, swing into The Golf Round I'll Never Forget by Matt Adams. Relive 50 of golf's most memorable moments through the eyes of the legends themselves. From Garcia's triumph at the 2017 Masters to Nicholas' miraculous 1986 comeback, it's the closest you'll get to walking the fairways with golf's greatest. Get your summer read on. Grab a copy of NBA 75 or The Golf Round I'll Never Forget. Available online or at your favorite bookstore.